Hello, today I'm here with poet Michael Waters. Uh, welcome, Michael. Good to be here, thank you. And he's going to read and discuss his poem for sign and breath. Shark River Bridge. That spot in the center of the bridge where the seam splits metal, where the two leaves of the span part for tuna boats, their seven foot rods rigged high as though trolling for God. That spot above the gray waters of the inlet where Avon by the sea arcs into Belmar. That's where I'll jump some wintry pre-dawn once dementia has commenced before it seeps a deeper into my brain and swerves me from my purpose, protects me from self-harm, makes my death dependent upon those whose love will stay their hand. I'll wear my black woolen overcoat, its pockets jangled with silverware, and wash down with a tumbler full of vodka, the long amassed tablets of Ambien before leaping toward oblivion. Watching our elders deepen into dementia, we rehearse escapes, exit fantasies. I will not gaze like my mother beyond the son who visits the memory care facility, will not pluck incessantly a ghost hair off my tongue or spin and spin again the buttons of my cardigan only to focus suddenly on his face and whisper those glinting hooks descending. I want to kill you. No. I will not. I've picked my spot. Before the uh, before we recorded, we were talking about the fact that as older poets, we uh, have a lot to say, but we don't know what it will be. But that poem, once again, hearing it and having first read it, I have the same reaction, which is just silence. Um, it's an amazing uh, work, Michael, of bravery and also of craft, because I know that when I started reading that poem, I did not have any clue that it was going to where it goes. And um, I'm curious what it feels like for you. Obviously, this is from a deep personal experience. What does it feel like for you to craft and then say, this poem? When I started writing the poem, it begins with description and I wasn't sure either where it was, where it was going. Um, but I walk almost every day. Um, I drive over to the boardwalk where, where the northern part of Ocean Grove meets the southern part of Asbury Park. I park there and I start walking south on the boardwalk for a couple of miles down to down to Belmar. And toward the end of that walk, I go over this, I go over that bridge. And my mom had been um, um, diagnosed with Alzheimer's some years ago. And I watched her um, deepen um, into that into that disease. And certainly, um, it was on my mind, because we all say, this is not where we're going to go. Um, if this starts to happen to me, here's what we need to do. Um, I don't know how many of us can go through with something like that. I always read that if you think you have Alzheimer's, you probably don't. And by the time you have it, it's too late to carry out any plan that you've, that you've made then. So I would stand up on that bridge and look down at that water. Occasionally um, the bells would go off and I'd have to get off that bridge quickly so the span could open and here would come those tuna boats. And the reason the bridge had to open was because they had these huge rods sitting there, right? And they were all baited and taking folks way out to go fishing for tuna. So I would watch this and then started connecting it with what was going on with my, uh, with my mom. There was that sense on one hand of that movement upward with those rods, that aspiration it seemed. On the other hand, you have those big hooks that are on there that you know are going to be working their way down. 
And all of a sudden this started to become an apt metaphor, it seemed for the brain, even the bridge itself with a span that kind of splits after a while. I mean, I started thinking of that in terms of that Alzheimer's um, and, uh, and then that worked its way, that worked its way into the poem. My fear, I think, worked its way into the poem. My horror at watching my mother um, deepen into the disease worked its way into the poem. And then, um, and then the language takes you where it wants to go. You know, the poem, the poem says what it, what it wants to be and you somehow have to follow that. Um, I'll keep talking for a minute here. Yeah. <laughs> Years ago in 1971, I was in London and I saw a series of lectures by Borges. And what he said in one of those, lux one of those um, lectures really struck me. Um, he said that Walt Whitman was a homosexual newspaper reporter who one day dreamed up the idea of Walt Whitman, the poet. <laughs> and he said, that reporter spent the rest of his life trying to write poems that only Walt Whitman, the poet, would write. And then there was a long pause and he said, but who can write poems like Walt Whitman? <laughs> <laughs> so I think one of the things that struck me about that in terms of myself when I was at the time 21 years old, I thought, well, who is, who is this Michael Waters who's writing poems that no one has ever asked him to write and nobody's gonna care if he stops writing them. So why am I, why am I writing them? But I seem to have this idea of, of Michael Waters, the poet, the poet that I wanted to be. And it seems that I've been spending the past, you know, 50 years trying to write poems that this poet that I imagine myself to be would, would write. And that's where that notion of voice comes in. Like, whose voice is this? Here's his voice as I imagine it, but can never quite attain it. And here's my voice working toward, working toward that voice. And then craft comes in because in terms of craft, it's not as if we're always in control. I mean, we're good at some things, but not others. And so we're really writing out of a kind of helplessness, like here's, here's what I can do, here's what I'm struggling with, and I'm always working to get, to get past that point somehow, to, trans, to transcend my limitations as a poet, you know, as a writer. And so, and so occasionally, I think, only occasionally, I manage to get to a poem that comes close, and I think, why can't I, why can't I do this all the time? This is what I would like to write. I just wrote a poem like this, why can't I write another one? But I can't. I don't even know how I wrote that one. And then that Great Depression starts, sets in, you know, like, what am I doing? Why, why, if I know about this stuff, you know, can I do better? But the more I learn, the harder it becomes. I think the more I deepen into my craft, the harder it becomes to make use of that craft and, and get, it, get it right as I think of it, so. That's amazing. Um, the harder, yes, the harder, the, the, the more you learn, the more helpless you become. Uh, it's a, that's an extraordinary uh, and profound reality, I think, for, for so many poets. It, having to do also just with the nature of the lyric, which is brief and therefore needs to be restarted every time. It's not as if you could just go back to the paragraph and say, oh, this is where I was, and now I'm going to go to the next paragraph. As you know, Hemingway said, I never leave the desk when I don't know what's coming next. Mm -hmm. um, with a poet, never, never really knows what's next and relies on that sense of of craft, and I think also as you were saying the poem, and I, and I'm receiving it now in a different way than I received it when you sent it to me originally. And I, I actually, I'll tell you, Michael, I, I read the poem and I was kind of stunned by it. And I, I got up and I went over to, to Elsa, my wife, and I, I read it out loud to her, and I couldn't get through it. And here, here is me not having composed it, and yet feeling so connected. And, I'm, and as I was listening to your reading, I was thinking, how can this man read these lines having also lived them? What did it feel like to actually, I mean, I don't know whether this is, whether this is something you've read before or not, but as you, you composed the poem and you were composed as you read the poem. And I'm just curious about what that felt like. Yeah, um, I read the poem only once before. I gave a reading last week in Maryland and read the poem for the first time. 
Um, I don't feel that I have the, the, um, the cadences down as I would like to have them. I'm still trying to figure out how to read the poem aloud. Um, the poem, all of my poems I like to think are written in, in lines. They're not written as big chunks. They're certainly not written in sentences, although the lines compose sentences. But I've said before that the integral unit of the poem is the line, as opposed to the sentence, which is the integral unit of prose. And so because poetry is written in lines, um, one has to learn, I think, to pay full attention to the line and as the line as a unit unto itself and how it begins and ends, how it sounds, how the syllables in that, in the words of that line clamor against each other, how the line is the fulfillment in some ways of um, all the lines that have come before it and how it anticipates the lines that come after it. And one of the ways that it does that for me is one in terms of a narrative that's set up and the narrative I would like it to be cohesive, but one way of creating cohesion is through the sound work too. Having the sounds in the line connect with sounds in other lines. So that now that we're writing free verse, that we moved away, most of us from um, traditional forms then, uh, we still haven't given up the formalities and the rhymes that would normally be in a traditional poem um, are still in free verse poem, at least is the way I want it to be for myself then, but they rhyme, the rhymes are all along the lines, not simply at the ends then. And so the poem, if it's going to become memorable, it's not simply for the story, for what is being said, um, but at least as important is how it's said. And that's where the craft, for me at least, comes in. I always want my poems to have a rich musical surface, which I like to think helps them become memorable if they are. Um, how many times have I found myself saying lines by poets that I'd not set out to memorize, but by reading them, by reading Emily Dickinson and Richard Wilbur and John Logan, um, all of a sudden I know those poems, you know? Wilbur's, you know, Edgar Dega purchased once, um, how did it go? Egedega purchased once a fine El Greco, which he kept against the wall beside his bed to hang his pants on while he slept. Mm -hmm. And I think, wow, I can't, you know, it's like listening to a Taylor Swift song. You can't get it out of your head after a while. So, so, and I hope, I mean, I love the fact that you responded to my poem that way, because I respond to certain poems that way. They just kill me. You know, I'm just so struck by them. But it's not simply the story that strikes me. It's always the way that story is told. It's the language that expresses it. Otherwise, it's an anecdote. And otherwise, it may as well have been told in prose. If you just remember the story, it doesn't matter whether it was lines or sentences, right? But if, if, it's, done, if it's done well, I think, if it's done the right way, then um, all of a sudden, that lodges itself within you, and it's hard to shake, shake out. And it also, in terms of voice, in terms of voice, I think, you know, I want to be that poet who has read and absorbed everything and then starts winnowing so that eventually what comes out of all of these poems, some of which I love, some of which I don't like, but I'm trying to articulate to myself all the time what I like and what I don't like and why then. And what comes out of that finally is a singular voice that may be the voice of the Michael Waters that I envision writing, writing poems. And, and, and that's, that's a voice that responds to the textile, the tactile quality of the words and responds to their, um, to their sensuality. And then that jibes with my own obsessions in terms of subject matter, which have to do with sensuality. And, and, and transgression and sin, um, especially in the recent work. Michael Waters, thank you so much for joining us today on Sign and Breath. Wow, that went fast. <laughs> <laughs> Shut him up. <laughs> Not at all. Is that 15 minutes? It was.